Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our lecture on Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. Uh, on behalf of all of us at Brookings Mountain West, we're pleased to have you here. We have colleague Ron Haskins out tonight who's going to solve the federal deficit for us. <laughs> That's the good news. The bad news is there's a rumor that we're going to be. Right. The bad news is the rumor is he'll be passing a hat at some point during the evening. But, uh, we're going to try and coax an opinion or two out of Ron. I'm not sure if we can do that, but we'll try. Uh, before I get any further, many of you saw President Smatrisk here. I can't proceed without asking him to come up and say a couple words of welcome. Well, you could. <laughs> you know, we've been uh, with Brookings now for uh, about <coughs> two plus years. And what we said when Brookings first came out to start the Mountain West program with us, and we knew Brookings scholars would be visiting, was that we were going to develop a deep, rich relationship. And that it was going to have impacts on our students in terms of educational quality and, and content. That it was going to produce Brookings non-resident fellows. That it was going to offer internship opportunities at some point for our students to work and publish with Brookings scholars and, and faculty and that it was going to lead to elevating the dialogue here in Las Vegas with inside the Beltway knowledge, uh, fertilizing the conversation. Uh, and I didn't mean that in any pejorative sense. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I'm looking two and a half years downstream, and the interaction between Lindsay and Brookings is perhaps one of the shining stars of this university. And I'm just here to say, uh, Bill, from the first days we started chatting, in very hypothetical sense about this to today has really made a difference on our city, on our region, and on UNLV. And when you understand that Brookings is now helping the governor develop its economic his economic diversification plan, you'll begin to realize the reach of this relationship and what universities do to provide potent resources that advance regions and lead to prosperity. So Bill, Ron, Bill, thank you all so much. This is terrific. Thank you. I knew I should have finished speaking before I introduced Neil. It's tough to follow. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming. It's been a busy political week in town. I don't know if you noticed. We, uh, earlier this week, we had Project New West in town, so we had Democratic Party leadership from across the region engaged in the issues that matter to Las Vegas and Nevada. The Western Republican leader, uh, Leadership Conference is here in town. And of course, the Republican debate was last night. Some of us were there. I hope many of you watched it. Just another indication of how important Las Vegas and Nevada are to the nation. Ron's going to talk about the federal deficit tonight. Just put in a brief commercial. One week from tonight, we'll have another Brookings colleague Audrey Singer will be out, an immigration specialist, and Audrey will be giving a talk on immigration, education, and U.S. economic competitiveness. So we are nothing if not timely here at Brookings Mountain West. I'm going to ask Bill Antholis, managing director of Brookings, to come up and introduce Ron. I don't want to steal too much of his thunder, but I just want to acknowledge Ron as the prototype for what we consider a Brookings scholar. Ron's made a number of trips out here. He's in classrooms with undergraduates and graduates. He's working with our UNLV faculty. He and a colleague, Vicki Stewart, who is right there. Vicky I'm sorry, Vicki Albert. Well, Vicki Stewart was an old girlfriend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw Patty, by the way. <laughs> you mean my first wife, right? <laughs> uh, Ron and Vicki ha have a grant and are, and are working on a project here. Ron's out meeting with nonprofits and community leaders, everything you know that we could hope for from a scholar. And a great lecturer, not to put too much pressure on him. You're going to hear from him tonight. But I'm going to ask Bill Antholis to come up and introduce him. Bill? Great. Thank you. It is it is really can it's not working. Uh, I'll just shout. It's it's terrific to be back. Um, I'm here usually four or five times a year, but I haven't been in this auditorium, I don't think, for a year and a half or so. And uh, it's, it's great to see a terrific turnout for a terrific scholar. 
you know, we have these three core these three core values that we use to brand Brookings: quality, independence, and impact. And Ron is the living embodiment of all three of those. And I'll start with the first and the third, and then come back to the the second on quality. If you just look at the the uh, list of publications that that Ron has uh, under his belt. It's an extraordinary accomplishment. He's written on everything from federal budget to uh, social welfare policy and a whole lot of things in between. And uh, he, he truly is one of the great scholars at Brookings. In fact, I said at a, a dinner last night that uh, he, it, I, don't, I don't really think if there's a scholar at Brookings that I think of more highly than Ron. And he immediately threw three back at me and including Alice Rivlin and, and, uh, and you know, I think highly of all of them, I don't think more highly of any of them than I do of Ron. Uh, and it's not just the quality of the work, but his impact. Ron was central to uh, the welfare reform that President Clinton and Speaker Gingrich signed into law in the, in the late 1990s. Um, he was in the White House with President Bush with some of the signature accomplishments that the Bush administration had on social policy that I think uh, were lost in the political uh, polarization that uh, that was part of the latter years of the Bush administration, or and even starting a little bit before then, and and continues through today. Um, so he does quality and impact. But the thing that I probably love the most about Ron is he's one of the most independent thinkers at Brookings. He sees a sacred cow and he goes after it. Um, and it's extraordinary the number of issues where he's willing to speak truth to people in his own party. Uh, having served in Republican administrations on Capitol Hill, to Democrats who look past issues and think uh, that they've figured out all the solutions, and even to people in the middle thinking about uh, where the next set of ideas are going to come from. So uh, with that, I, I'm just delighted to turn the microphone over to, uh, to Ron to, to talk about probably the biggest challenge facing the United States, uh, which is the long-term federal deficit. Well, thanks for that nice introduction. It takes me five or six minutes to overcome a fine introduction like that, so we'll see how I do uh, tonight. Um, uh, Bill already mentioned that we went to the uh, debate last night, and I learned a lot of debate, and I wanted to share some of it with you because I think you'll see some real insights uh, that I've achieved by uh, attending that debate. I have four of them. First, Newt Gingrich can answer every question, including ones that weren't asked. <laughs> Second, Herman Cain's answer to every question is 999. I actually credit Bill Brown for uh, suggesting that to me. Uh, Governor Perry is twice as smart as Mr. Cain because he has two answers to questions. The first one is, we could solve all the nation's problems by tapping the energy that is underneath our feet. And the second one is that Governor Romney hires illegal immigrants. <laughs> And finally, Governor Romney uh, has at least two positions he's not changed in the last four years, but it's hard to tell which ones they are. <laughs> so that's what I learned from the debate last night. Uh, you probably learned more than I did. Um, Bill asked me to talk for just a moment about my experiences in Washington, D.C., and then uh, just a few words about what I've been up to here in, uh, in Las Vegas. So I'll do that. Um, in D.C., I, was with, I went to Washington uh, in 1985. I was going to be there for one year. I was on a sabbatical from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And my plan was to go to Washington and see how social science evidence had an impact on public policy. Uh, and then I was going to go back to UNC and write the definitive book on the use of evidence to influence policy. That was almost 30 years ago. I'm still in Washington. I haven't written a book. But I am working on it. I actually got a grant uh, last year to do some work on this because the Obama administration has done more in this area than any all previous administration combined. Really quite remarkable what the Obama administration is doing. Um, then I went to work for the Ways and Means Committee. I've been there for the first year. I was in Senator Simon's office, who was a, he's now deceased, but a spectacular American and a great senator. Uh, and I worked in his office for a year primarily on employment and training issues. And then I went to the Ways and Means Committee. I was a Republican, but he let me through the door anyway. Uh, and I went to the Ways and Means Committee and worked on the Republican staff. I'd, after been there for many years, uh, I, we Republicans became the majority. And then I became the majority staff director of the Welfare Subcommittee. And we wrote the Welfare Reform Bill. 
uh, in 96, which was quite an adventure, and I know all of you would be really enticed by that. I wrote a book about it. I think it's a very interesting book. A number of colleges have used it in uh, undergraduate and even graduate courses because it tells how you actually pass legislation in Washington. And it's full of all kinds of anecdotes, all kinds of interesting things that Newt did, some of which I don't think I should say in public. Uh, and uh, all, all kinds of problems that you run into when you're trying to influence legislation and so forth. So the name of the book is Work Over Welfare. I hope some of you have a chance to read it. Um, and then I went, had a chance to go to Brookings. I wanted to close out my career with scholarship because I began as a scholar and wanted to end as a scholar. So I was fortunate to get an appointment at Brookings and uh, my colleague Bell Sawhill and I have a center there called the Center on Children and Families. Uh, and then in 2002, the Bush administration asked me to come and head up a welfare reform effort that they made, and I agreed to do that, and I did that for one year, and then went back to Brookings. I've been back at Brookings uh, ever since. So that's a brief uh, thumbnail sketch of my Washington, D.C. experience. Uh, in Las Vegas, I've, uh, at UNLV, I've been working on four things. Um, uh, last year, I had a chance to work with a couple of faculty members here, uh, Ralph Reynolds and uh, Sylvia Lazos, and it just so happened I added, along with my colleagues at Princeton and my colleague at Brookings Bell Sawyer, we had, uh, added a journal called The Future of Children. And every issue is devoted to a particular uh, issue that affects children. And we, just by coincidence, had already decided several years before to devote an entire issue uh, to immigrant children. And what a topic that is, oh my lord. Uh, and they have suffered from every problem you could possibly imagine. Uh, and so when we came out here, there are a number of people here, as you might imagine, including Sylvia and John, who are interested in immigrants, and we planned and had a very nice public event, uh, invited other people to come about what we could do in the schools in Las Vegas to improve uh, the education of immigrant children, which is something that we sorely need. So that was one thing I worked on. I also am working now with Vicki Albert, uh, who changes her name, I guess. I have more than one name. And, uh, <laughs> And we're working on uh, temporary assistance for needy families, which is a cash welfare program, which didn't increase much during the recession. And we're pretty surprised about that. So the Pew Foundation gave us money to figure out why it didn't. And as always happens, it varies greatly across the states. So we hope to take advantage of that variance across the states to try to figure out factors in the states that might be related to why the, this cash welfare program did not help many additional people during the recession when unemployment, as you all know, reached uh, amazing heights. Uh, I also have been working on child support enforcement, uh, something I've been very uh, interested in for many, many years, and I've worked with many states. I've been on boards of uh, child support companies. Uh, and um, so I've been working with the, uh, with the county here. I'm not sure we're going to be able to pull it off because you probably don't know this, but there is a lack of money in the state of Nevada. Uh, but we would like to institute a program to train fathers so that they can work so that they can pay their child support. That's the number one limiting factor in child support is many of the fathers are unemployed. And unfortunately, as you might guess, the unemployed fathers tend to be low-income fathers and they tend to have low-income uh, women that they were married to or had a baby with. And so the mothers are poor. They don't get much help from the father, which would really help them a great deal. Uh, and so the, what we would like to be able to do is to, uh, is to teach those fathers skills that are used in a local labor force and get them to work so they pay child support. And then finally, Vicki and I have been working uh, and we're hoping to offer a course, an undergraduate course in poverty and homelessness within a year or a year and a half or so. So that's what I've been up to here at Brookings. And I think that's roughly tracks with what other scholars here do, um, uh, regardless of what the topic area is. So let me talk about the budget deficit. I'm going to try to talk for about uh, 25 minutes now and then leave plenty of time for questioning. This chart, I love this chart because I've seldom had a chart for any topic I've worked on that was so nicely captured the nature of the problem. So here you have the percent of GDP and here you have years all the way out to past 2080 and this black line right here is the average revenues collected by the federal government over roughly a four decade period. It's about 18 point something percent. So these, these are going to be our revenues. If the revenues were 18 percent in this year right here, 2023, it would take every single penny of income for the federal government to pay for three things. 
our Social Security, our health programs, and net interest, leaving nothing except what we could borrow from the Chinese uh, for any other activity. So this is just, it's a, such a shocking thing that a nation like ours could allow, allow ourselves to get in this situation where we are really, truly going off a cliff. We're going to be bankrupt. Uh, the richest, greatest nation in the world is going to be bankrupt. And the main reason, as I will say repeatedly, is because of the lack of discipline by both the American people and our elected officials, uh, especially the elected officials we send to Washington. States have to balance their budgets, and they are much more courageous. I don't know if politicians at the state level are more courageous. They get to Washington, they lose all that courage, I can tell you that. Uh, but states have to balance their budgets, so they do cut programs and raise taxes, and states have been through this for the last several years. So this is the nature of our problem. What are we going to do about this? Let me point out one thing to you that I think is really interesting. Uh, well, two things. First, Medicare and health in general, but especially Medicare, are really the biggest problem of all. That is, unless we solve Medicare, put this, write this down, and remember when the Congress is reaching these various agreements that they're supposed to reach over the next two or three months, if they don't do something serious about Medicare, we're going to continue to have the problem that we have now. They simply must change Medicare, which is very difficult, very politically risky. The American people don't want it. They say that repeatedly in polls. I'll show you that in a few minutes. Uh, but they have to do it. So Medicare, as you can see by the expanding line here, is the biggest spending part of the problem. But what many people don't realize is, the, is that the bigger problem even is interest rates. Now, right, or not interest rates, but interest payments. Uh, we're borrowing a huge amount of money, and in order to pay for all the programs we have now, if we don't change something, we're going to be borrowing more and more and more. And at this point in 2080 or so, which we will never get there because people will stop putting this money long before that, and hopefully uh, members of Congress will actually do something about it, uh, as you can see that the interest that we're going to pay is almost twice as much as the Medicare. Now, I was raised in the Midwest in a fairly conservative family. And one of the things my mom and dad always taught me was live within your means. You sit down at the table and balance your books. Don't spend it if you don't have it. Don't borrow excessively and so forth. Only borrow to buy a car or a house, my dad told me several times. And yet we're reaching the point, we're getting close already, where we are spending a huge amount of money just to pay back the guys that we got the money from to buy the things that we already have. And the worst thing, the worst of all that's shameful is that we're passing it all on to our kids and grandkids. They're the ones that are going to have to figure out how to pay this money back. So this is really, this is really a pitiful performance by both the American public uh, and by our politicians, especially our federal politicians. And let's explore a little more about what we could do. Uh, here's another way to look at the deficit. It, it includes a few more things. I think military defense is pretty interesting. Defense is not a major part of the problem, and defense is becoming less a part of the problem. And I think we've actually reached a state in Washington where we have already planned so many defense cuts. I believe that there, I know that there are lots of Republicans who are alarmed about it, and now there are lot, getting to be more and more Democrats who are alarmed about it, which is quite unusual. Democrats would clearly rather protect entitlement spending than military spending, and yet there's increasing alarm about military. I'll show you that in a few minutes. Social Security is not a huge problem. It's going to increase by about a percentage of GDP, uh, despite the huge increases uh, in the baby boom retirement. And again, we come to Medicaid, Medicare, our health programs. This is where the real problem is. Uh, and then all other non-interests we're already beginning to see, even as early as 2020, nine years from now, that there will be a squeeze on all other spending, as I implied in the first uh, part of the presentation. So a lot of programs that we know and love, Head Start, our education spending, much of the money that we spend on universities and so forth, much of our research money uh, uh, that funds NIH is already scheduled to decline by the Congressional Budget Office before we've done any serious cutting. And then again, net interest is the biggest part of the problem, and here you see the deficit out here. So now, here's what I want to talk about. First, I want to talk about the sources of all this debt that we've accumulated, where it came from. I think it may be some surprises for you. Uh, and then I want to talk about the preconditions. What do we have to do? What do we have to establish to take action and do something about the deficit? Then I want to talk about the debt ceiling deal. 
uh, that we uh, achieved, I use the word achieved lightly, uh, in August. And then I want to talk about specific action on three programs, Social Security, Medicare, and tax increases. And then finally, I want to talk about public support for action. We'll have about 15 minutes at the end uh, to ask questions, assuming that I move through these slides at the speed of light. Um, okay, so this is kind of a wild estimate. What, here's the basic idea of this. CBO projected spending and deficits in 2001, all right? And they projected that we would have surpluses as far as the eye could see. Some of you may remember this, that we were going to have big surpluses. And there was actually, if you can believe it, there was concern in Congress that we were going to have way too much money in the federal government. We had to figure out some way to spend it because you shouldn't be hoarding that money. It could have a, you know, a kind of a reverse Keynesian effect on the economy. Uh, and at that time, I think the, uh, the total uh, surplus was something like $2.3 trillion. As it turned out, once we got through with all the spending we'll talk about in a few minutes, and I've showed you some of it already, uh, as it, uh, we turned things around to the tune of about $12 trillion. So we went from about a little over two, 2.3, something like that, trillion dollar surplus to a $10 trillion deficit over the decade from 2001 to 2011. Uh, and very nifty way they did this analysis. I'm not sure it really uh, would stand up to very, very close scrutiny, but I think it's in the ballpark. And so now where to come from? First, new spending. One thing you can always count on is Congress loves to spend money, and they love to spend money because the American people love them to spend the money because the American people largely get the benefits from it. Now, some of this is for war, become very controversial in the American public, uh, but um, and much of the spending on the war has been bipartisan. Uh, economic estimates, 4.1. This is an interesting lesson. What this really means, there's some technical adjustments here, but the real change here is the American economy. That is one of the biggest things that changed is that our economy fell apart, and we have deficits because we're spending way more than we thought we would on unemployment insurance and all sorts of welfare programs, especially the Medicaid program. And even more important, we're getting less in revenue because when the economy is not going well, people don't have so much income, they don't pay as much in taxes. And that is $4 trillion of this $12 trillion turnaround. And then finally, tax cuts. You know, we figure as long as we're spending all this new money, we're such a good country, we ought to give people a break and cut their taxes and we don't need to pay for anything, we can fight wars and we can have new Medicare benefit, drug benefit. Uh, and we don't need to pay for it, we'll just cut taxes at the same time. So th these were all very wise decisions, as you can see. Um, so that's where the deficit came from. Now here's a little bit more detail, this should say 2003. 1.7 from the tax cuts, uh, and then um, one, other tax cuts besides the ones in 2001, 2003, about 0.7 trillion. Uh, interest, other defense, and so forth. So you can see that there are lots of different categories where we lack budget discipline, lack fiscal discipline in Washington, uh, and the result is the budget situation that we're in now. So now, here, this is very important to me. I think about this a lot. I've written about it a little bit, uh, and I think it's more or less correct that this is what we have to have if we are going to actually attack the deficit in a meaningful way and do something about it. The first thing is there has to be a public recognition that the deficit is a problem. We did not really have that until roughly the mid-2000s, uh, 2004, 2005. Before that, the American people did not seem to be aware that we were running these huge deficits in Washington. At that time, they're nothing like they are now, but they were still substantial deficits. And with a booming economy, it's pretty hard to figure out why we would be running deficits in the, in the 1990s. And in fact, Congress took action. And as I already pointed out, we increased taxes and cut spending, what a fabulous idea that is for reducing the deficit, you know, slow down your spending, increase your income. Uh, works every time as far as I can tell. Uh, and we did that in 1990, we did it again, a big one in 1997, and that's where those surpluses came from. Uh, but the public, at, when we started going south in roughly 2000, 2001, the public did not recognize and did not do anything. Now the public seems to be alarmed. And I think even alarmed is a fair word. Uh, a recent CBS poll showed that about 70% of the public thought that the deficit was the nation's worst problem, most serious problem. So this, I think we really have made progress here. 
But uh, we have not made progress in the second point, which is the public's willingness to actually absorb some blows to do something about it. This is very discouraging. The public says, oh, we have a deficit. We've got to do something about the deficit. And then we say, okay, let's increase taxes. No, 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 they don't want to increase taxes. Oh, well, okay, well, let's cut Medicare or Social Security. Oh, no, 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 we can't, cut, can't be cutting those programs. This is what poll after poll after poll shows. Now, you know the American public is pretty intelligent. You'd think that they would realize if you're actually going to cut the deficit, you either have to raise revenue or cut spending. But evidently, that is a point that escapes the American public. I, 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 that part of it, I don't understand. And then third, in Washington now, everything has to be on the table. This is a crucial problem that we face now. Everything is definitely not on the table. Republicans are, I use the word in something I wrote re recently, nuts about tax increases. They, we're not going to have any tax increases. Well, if you know one thing about politics, compromise is the heart of politics, and especially when you're in a huge situation like we're in now, both sides have got to give something. They're, Democrats are never going to support serious cuts in entitlement programs unless Republicans are willing to increase taxes. It just will not happen. And besides that, the underlying justification as far as I'm concerned is we have a Social Security program, we have a Medicare program, Republicans have re proposed some changes in those programs, but even the changes they've proposed, which they're being attacked for by Democrats, would not really get to the heart of the deficit problem. Maybe one thing Ryan has proposed would. We can come back and talk about that in a few minutes. So Democrats are unreasonable about entitlements, and Republicans are unreasonable about taxes. Other than that, we're making serious progress in Washington. We're going to solve this thing any time. The next thing is bipartisanship. I think the polls show I hardly need to say a word about this. Everybody in the country understands. Uh, I hear some choice language. My mom lives in Michigan. I go there three or four times a year and I usually wind up talking to what I regard as normal people out there in the countryside. And, uh, and they really, and I, same thing here in Las Vegas. They do not have high regard for folks that they send to Washington. Now, in many cases, they like their own congressmen, but all, all the rest of them are idiots. Uh, and if you look at their actions on the budget, I think you'd have a hard time disproving the charge of idiocy in Washington. Um, and then finally, presidential leadership. I was telling Bill last night, um, my colleague Bill Saw Hill and I, uh, and by the way, we've been writing about the deficit for something like seven years. We published three books and lots of articles and so forth, so we could see this coming a long time ago. And w about three or four years ago, we wrote a chapter for the book about previous big deals that Washington had reached. It's not like Washington is not able to do this. 1983, Washington passed a very controversial, very tough uh, Social Security uh, uh, reform that reduced Social Security benefits, increased retirement age, and so forth. Uh, Moynihan was a key player in that, and many others as well. Um, the 86 tax changes, I'll talk about those again in a few minutes. It, you know, it's, this is like the e e economist's dream of tax reform. Broaden the base by getting rid of tax expenditures, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, and reduce everybody's rates. It increases economic efficiency and so forth. So we passed a huge bill in 1986. If you're interested in this, there's a spectacular book about it called Showdown at Gucci Gulch, uh, referring to the lobbyists. I always loved it. I worked on welfare programs, and the guys that came and lobbied me, you know, was often the mousy little people, and they were, you know, $80 suits and so forth. The guys that lobby on taxes wear $500 tailored suits and these wonderful, uh, you know, always have tassels on their shoes and so, oh, God, I don't, you know, I don't have any tassels. So um, there's quite a difference in the lobbying efforts in Washington, but this is a wonderful book. It's a bill, there were about three bills that passed when I was uh, working in Congress that there's no way that they pass. There, you just could not pass these bills, and yet they passed. So the system rose the occasion, and, uh, and presidential leadership and bipartisanship and everything on the table in all of these big cases. So Bell and I decided we would call staffers and members who had been involved in one or more of these big deals. We called 20 people, 10 Democrats, 10 Republicans. The thing they agreed on the most was that you can't do a big deal in Washington without presidential leadership. And I think we have not had great presidential leadership. I've already said I'm a Republican. Maybe you think I'm biased. 
Uh, but the president had a great opportunity when his own commission, uh, the Bowles Simpson Commission, proposed a perfectly reasonable plan that would have gone a long way toward reducing the deficit. And we had two Republicans, very important conservatives, very influential conservatives, um, Crapo and Coburn, you know, out on the end of the, what are those things that you, they used to, oh, the plank. They walk the plank and, you know, go in and the sharks eat you. Well, that's where they were because they agreed to tax increases, which is completely unheard of for Republicans in Washington at this point. And they're still being punished for it. And yet the president virtually ignored that report. That would have really made a difference. I think we might have been able to really make some progress uh, because the Republicans were starting to split. But the president did not exert great leadership, at least in my opinion, maybe someone will want to, Stand up for the president when we get the question and answer period. Um, so here is what happened uh, to, this is where another uh, view of what we need to do in order to solve uh, the deficit. And I think this begins to give you an idea of the kind of action and the breadth of the action we need. So if we were going to bring a deficit, I should say something about 60% of GDP. The National Academy of Sciences did a very interesting study. They had a big panel together former CBO directors, really good bipartisan group, mostly people who are serious about things like deficits and not, and in fact, there were really no serious politicians as part of the group. And they carefully analyzed the problem, and they recommended that if we could get the deficit to 60% of GDP and keep it there, that that would be, that go a long way toward a solution. We should make more progress in the future, but 60% of GDP would be great. Uh, so here's what it would take to get to 60% of GDP by 2021. We'd have to take these actions in 2011, and if we, I'm sorry, in, yeah, in 2011, and if we took these actions in 2011, by 2021, we would be at 60% of GDP, and if we kept, held, held all these policies in place, we would have made a huge achievement. This would be really a great thing for the Congress and the President to do. But if they did it with only discretionary spending, they would have to cut discretionary spending almost in half, if, it, if, if that was the only thing that it did was discretionary spending. And pretty much, so far, that's all we've done is discretionary spending. That's the easiest to cut. If we did only mandatory spending, that would be 21. We'd have to reduce it by a fifth. If we did it, if it combined it, we could reduce by 15%. If we, did, if we did it all on the tax side and did only income taxes, we'd have to increase income taxes by 36%. I can tell you right now, in your lifetime, in my lifetime, in God's lifetime, we are not going to increase taxes 36%. Uh, and if we did all revenues, not just income taxes, but all sorts of revenue, tariffs, and so forth, uh, we'd only have to increase it by 16%. And look at this wonderful little number over here. If we split it between taxes and spending and spread the pain widely, only 8%. We'd have to increase revenues 8%, and we'd have to decrease spending 8%. So that's not outrageous. It's not terrible. It, it, it would produce serious pain, but it's not terrible. It, all right, so let's talk about the, what Congress has actually done, keeping in mind what the level of what we need to try to do. Uh, a lot of people have criticized Republicans for the debt ceiling deal, and the basic charge is, whoa, we've increased the debt ceiling you know, scores of times in the past. It happens all the time. There's never been such a huge fight about it before. Usually the minority party screams and yells, but then the majority party uh, gives them a nickel or something, and they capitulate, and there's no problem with passing the debt ceiling, because if we did not increase the debt ceiling, we'd, you know, we'd forfeit on our, on our loans, and that would have tremendous repercussions. And this created huge panic, as you may recall, came right up until the end. Um, in Republicans' defense, I would say that we did take the first serious concrete step toward reducing the deficit, and that did come out of the debt ceiling, and we might be ready to take a second step, which is one of the, things, the main things I want to talk about. So here are the three parts of the deal. First of all, you raise the deficit ceiling, and the president was, I think, very wise. He wanted to make sure that whatever happened, we didn't have to face a debt ceiling debate again until after the presidential election. And then they actually reduced the deficit by 900, this is almost a trillion dollars, that's the biggest cut in spending ever. It was all on the spending side. Uh, and then, very important for our discussion today, they established a super committee, and they gave the super committee the task 
of getting $1.5 trillion in deficit reduction. So that would be, uh, roughly speaking, be over $2 trillion, almost $2.4 trillion in deficit reduction if they actually got $1.5 trillion. Now, just as a rough rule of thumb, we need four, maybe $5 trillion to get us to the 60% over the long run. So it's not getting us there, but what huge steps. I mean, if we started this 10 years ago, we'd be a lot better off than we are now. So all in all, I think it was a pretty good deal. Now, here's an interesting way to think about it. What do de Democrats want and what do the Republicans want? So cuts in defense. Democrats, they, they, they're perfectly fine with cuts in defense. Uh, and Republicans you know, normally do not want cuts in defense. So Democrats won on this one. There were, there were cuts in, there are going to be cuts in defense, so Democrats like that, and Republicans don't. How about no cuts in the big entitlement programs? That was something the Democrats refused to abide, and there, there's a little exception to this, but there certainly are no big cuts in entitlements yet, uh, and so Republicans lost. Uh, on this issue as well. Democrats won because we didn't cut any big entitlements, but it could happen. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then no tax increases. This is where Republicans, this was the way Republicans, the issue Republicans won on. Now I want to make a point about this that I think is real important, and that is I think that this shows that the Republican Party is so focused on one thing that they actually lost sight of one of their traditional goals, which is to make sure the country is well defended. Now, you can have all kinds of opinions about whether we spend too much or uh, too little on defense, but it, clearly it has always been a main goal of the Republican Party. But Republicans are now so focused on not allowing taxes to increase that they gave up on what has traditionally been a very important goal, and that is defense of the country. And as I said, the result has been, as I'll show you in just a minute, that even Democrats are concerned that we might be cutting defense too much. All right, so this is, um, this is the impact of the debt ceiling deal on, if, if, they, if they actually do it, on, on, uh, on the deficit. So we're expected to have $11.6 trillion uh, in deficits over the nine year period, 10 year period between 2012 and 2021. And after the debt ceiling deal, we're all the way down to 9.5 trillion. So we're making great progress, right? Now this does depend on uh, this does depend on the second shoe, uh, which is that 1.5 billion uh, that the super committee is supposed to be proposing now. So uh, the 917 billion from the 10 years that is already Congress is already making some of these cuts. This is one of the things that's accounting for the ugliness in Washington now, uh, is because they are actually cutting these programs. The, the agreement did not actually cut the program. It said, we're going to cut discretionary down, but then within discretionary, there are literally thousands of programs. Now the appropriations committees are actually cutting those programs, and that's where it gets really ugly. Uh, half of it is from domestic, half of it is from defense and security, and then there's a firewall between them, but only for 2012, which means you, the Congress must take half out of defense and must take half out of non-defense uh, discretionary. Uh, and here you can see what, what has happened so far. This is what's going to happen. Uh, this, is, um, this is defense spending. It was scheduled to be $891 billion in 2021. And this, these cuts are being made right now, even as we speak. And these are the cuts that are going to be made under the most plausible scenario of what the, of what the uh, super committee is doing. So we'll be all the way down from 891 to 773. Now that's really, that's, those are very substantial cuts. And exactly the same thing is happening uh, in non-defense appropriated accounts. Uh, so we're, this is what we've already achieved here from, uh, from 656. And if there's a second round of cuts, which we're going to talk about in just one second, we'll be down to 584 billion dollars. So now the super committee, what are they supposed to do and how are they going to do it? They're supposed to get an additional, after the 917 or 0.9 trillion, they're supposed to get, uh, they're supposed to get 1.5 trillion in, in cuts uh, or tax increases. It can be both revenues and tax. They basically can do whatever they want to to achieve the end and think back to the previous chart where I showed you how much better it would be if they split it between taxes uh, and uh, between revenues and spending. They're supposed to report their proposal to the Congress by November 23rd. 
The Congress is supposed to vote on the proposal by December 23rd. And now, a super important thing, the rules by which they consider whatever is recommended by the committee are the best you could possibly have. In fact, I am really confident that if the super committee produces an agreement, which means at least one Republican or one Democrat is going to have to break ranks on important issues, if they're able to do that and they send a proposal to the Congress that saves $1.5 trillion, it will pass. It'll pass the Congress. Even if there's tax increases, Republicans will vote for it. And even if there's something on Medicare, Democrats will vote for it. I don't think they'll turn their back because the public will be so focused on this. And I just I, I think it's very unlikely that if they could actually reach agreement, that it would not pass the Congress and the president would sign it. So now the question is, will they really, will they really pass it? And notice this is especially important here, no filibuster. So that thing goes to the Congress, and they have to vote on it. No filibuster, no amendments, nothing. Take it or leave it. Now, a lot of people criticize the Congress for this, uh, that they should, you know, they're shirking their responsibility. They should be able to work this out themselves. Well, you know, I kind of agree with that, but I've been there. I've been watching them. So have you probably. They can't do it. They have not made any serious progress. And to get $917 billion, they just about, you know, there's blood all over the, in every room in Washington. So they needed some help. They came up with this, you know, kind of wonky sort of thing. Uh, and I, it's not great policy, but if it works, who's going to complain? I'm not. All right, so now, action. What could we actually do to solve it? Oh, my gosh, I lost track of time. So Social Security. There are a bunch of reforms to Social Security. Social Security is not a huge problem. There are many things we could do. Uh, this is, um, here's a good one. This is a tax covered earnings above the tax minimum. You know, we stop uh, taxing Social Security uh, income. Income for purposes of Social Security tax, we stop at about 100, I think it's $106,800. If you lifted that cap, that would take care of 90% of the problem. And there are many other possibilities here. You can mix and match these. Congress could do this if there were any goodwill at all. Um, now, the hardest problem is health expenditures. I cannot emphasize this enough. And you can see why in this chart. Here are the 1960s, 70s, and so forth. And this is the average annual increase in health expenditures compared to GDP. Okay? So look at this. Health is going at the rate of almost 8% and GDP at 4% in the 1960s. And then 5.7 and so forth. Even in the 2000s, where we've been able to get health care expenditures somewhat uh, reduced, we're, they're still to 4.3%. They're still more than twice as high as the uh, growth rate of the GDP. So this means we're spending more and more and more of our treasure on health. And I can just tell you right off the bat, we're not getting very good results. We spend more than any country in the world. And by many basic measures of health uh, of results, we are not getting good results. Uh, let me give you one example. There's a fabulous article in New Yorker a couple of years ago by a guy named Atal Gawande. And he argued, he actually gave an example of McAllen, Texas, compared to San Jose, Texas. The average cost per Medicare recipient in McAllen, Texas was $15,000. The average cost in San Jose, or uh, I think it was San Jose, another... Uh, Texas City was half that. Half that. Now how can you explain that? Part of the answer has got to be that we have the world's worst health care system. And the basic problem is that people who get health care don't pay for it. And that is, a, no matter what the product is, that's a pres prescription for disaster. If people don't have to pay for something, they can't get enough of it. And furthermore, we've set up the Medicare program so that the way doctors and hospitals make money is to do more and more tests more and more routines, so the incentives are more health care, more tests, more drugs, more everything, and there's nothing really to stop them. Uh, if you read that article, Gawande describes the kind of factors that took place in, uh, in, um, in San Jose. It is in San Jose. I think I have in my nose. El Paso, I'm sorry. El Paso, Texas, uh, that helped them control their health care costs, and it would be great if we could do that on a national basis. So now I want to just describe very quickly, because I think this is the most important reform that we could get to, 
We could control Medicare costs, I believe, with something called premium support. There will still be pain. People are going to pay more. Maybe they're going to get less uh, medical services, but we don't have any choice, as you could tell by those previous charts. So here is what the way, here is a, something that might work. It'd be great if we could do a three or four states do an experiment on this, but I think that's unlikely. But all right, so first of all, you divide the country up into service areas. Think of them as metropolitan areas. And then the government specifies a mandatory health care plan. You could have more, but you must at least offer these certain things. And almost every plan that's been proposed so far, it's the services that are offered in Medi Medicare. So in order to compete, in order to play the game here, you have to cover everything that's currently covered by Medicare, and you could cover more. And then you have an open market. Any organization, hospitals and groups of doctors, insurance companies, anybody could submit a bid of what they would accept as a premium payment in order to provide this health insurance. And then there would be a central clearinghouse. You've got to have a referee here that accepts the bids, make sure the bids meet all the qualifications. Uh, and also, very importantly, because a lot of people on Medicare are feeble and have trouble making decisions, they need help, and this organization will be charged with helping them, giving them advice, answering their questions, and so forth, and they have to be completely neutral. Some of you may be recognizing that these things are very similar to exchanges that are in, uh, in, the, um, uh, in the health care legislation that Congress passed last year. Uh, which Republicans say they're going to repeal, but this would be a very, the exchanges would be a very important element that could help with all of these areas here. And then setting the annual premiums amount. This is the key. This is the key. So the government would say, we are going to give you a certain amount of money. You'll go on the market. You buy a health care plan, these, any of these bids here. And the key is how they decide where that premium is set. And this is how we can start to get the cost of control. And it will mean that many people have to pay more for their health care. Uh, that's inevitable in whatever we do. So the government would say we're going to pay a certain number of thousand dollars. You get it. You go in the market and you buy the plan that you think will help you. If you want a more expensive plan, you have to pay the difference. Um, and then the next thing is how does it increase from year to year? This is really the key. Brookings scholars like Henry Aaron, who are terrific experts, want to make sure that if we go to premium support, which they, do, they would not support premium support. Aaron and lots of people on the left do not support. They think it's too dangerous and elderly will wind up being hurt by it. So they're saying, but if we did it, it has to be the actual measure by which health care costs increased the previous year. So if it increased, think of the previous slide, if it increased 7%, then the premium increases 7%. And I go in and buy something this year, I have as much money as I had last year, plus 7%, because that's the average of the market. Now, there are two plans that have been offered that have gotten a lot of attention. One of them was offered by Representative Ryan. And that no, not only did not bear a relationship to the true increase in health care costs, he just said uh, by dictum that it is going to increase by the average inflation rate. Well. The average inflation rate is roughly 3%. It's less than that now, but over most years it's 3%. And the average increase in health care costs is about 7%. So do the math. That means that the elderly are going to take a huge hit under the Ryan plan. Unless this thing works, then the health care increases less rapidly, which is, of course, what Ryan argues. Um, Alice Rivlin, a very famous Brookings scholar, has proposed a plan with Pete Domenici. Uh, and they would do it, the rate of the growth of the economy, which is usually bigger than inflation, plus one percentage point. That would get close to health, the actual increase in health care costs, but it's not based on health care costs, so these are the kind of things that Aaron uh, rejects out of hand. And I just, as an aside here, I'm on the seventh floor of Bookings, my office is here, Henry Aaron's is here, Alice Rivlin's is here. I hear some really great discussions in the hallway between Alice Rivlin and Henry uh, and uh, Henry Aaron, I'll tell you. So this would really be a remarkable thing. I, I, I'm very confident eventually we're going to wind up with something like this. This is what we're going to have. Uh, but it's going to take us a long time to get there, I'm afraid. And meanwhile, we're going to be spending more and more and more. The last step is taxes. I'm only going to talk about tax expenditures. 
This is, in effect, spending through the tax code. We could either do it by giving people tax breaks or we could just pay them, as we do in you know, welfare programs and so forth. Uh, and here, a whole list, there are over 100 of these. We spend $1.1 trillion through the tax code in this way. And this is the kind of reform we had in 86. Every economist agrees, close the loopholes, broaden the base, reduce everybody's rate. And we could do this in a way where we would not reduce the rates to use up all that extra money we're going to get by broadening the base. And that's how we could produce revenue. Uh, so this, had, this is a great idea. There has in the past been bipartisan agreement on it. And the obstacle course is Republicans do not want to have any kind of tax uh, increase at all. So now let me stop here and take a few questions. And let me do, before that, let me say this in summary. It's notable if you look at what I presented here. We do have very solid ideas. Some of them are supported by very good research of what we should do or could do about Social Security, what we could do about Medicare, and what we could do to raise taxes that would actually improve the efficiency of our economy and help lots of Americans. So it isn't for a lack of possibilities. It's just that we lack the political will in Washington. And as long as we lack that will in Washington, this problem will not be solved, and our kids are going to pay a very, very steep price. Yes? Uh, one of your colleagues, Pete Singer, came out and spoke a lot about artificial intelligence and the changes that are going on in, in, in the world. Um, going to your other aspects of your, your life, you know, work over welfare and that type thing, are we going to see a new uh, level of full employment? Is it, I don't, you know where I'm going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what uh, does that do to these numbers? I, look, here's two perspectives. One is a lot of economists think where it's going to be a decade, it's going to be a very, very long time before we come back. A big important element in the mix is that America <coughs> does not lead the world in education. I was just at a meeting uh, with the legislature in Wisconsin last week, and we had a panel of businessmen. And they, every single one of them, they're all in manufacturing, and every one of them said they had jobs, they're looking for people, it's driving them nuts, they're losing money because they can't find people for skilled work. I mean, and it, this is just unheard of in America, and it's because our education system is so weak. Or that's at least the main reason, and I think there are issues about our families as well. Uh, but we have to improve our educational system. And then maybe, you know, we'll have more technology, we'll have more skills, maybe we'll come back to full employment. We've always done it in the past, so to the extent that we're guided by the past, I think there's reason to be optimistic, but boy, the next two, four, six, or more years, I find it difficult to be optimistic. Yes? Most important thing a college-age student needs to know about the deficient. Most important thing what? That a college student needs to know about all these numbers. The, oh, the most important thing? Oh, you should memorize all of them. Of course. <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, I'm going to get your addresses, your email address. I'm going to send this to you afterwards, and the next time I come back, I'm going to seek you out and give you a written test. Um, the most important numbers are the Medicare numbers, because really Medicare is the heart of this problem. Uh, and it's the one that we're least likely to solve, again, primarily, not because of lack of ideas, but because of politics. That, and both parties are guilty. Democrats now are beating the hell out of Republicans because of the Ryan plan, which was a version of premium support, and they're going to use it in the election for sure. But Republicans, when the Congress passed the Affordable Care Act, which they refer to affectionately as Obamacare, uh, Republicans criticized the president for taking, I think it was $50 billion uh, out of Medicare. And they just raved on and on. I could not believe my ears the first time I heard this. So Republicans are criticizing Democrats for taking money out of Medicare. You know, this, it's crazy. So our political system is the main problem. But Medicare, the numbers and the concepts, that's, that's what you should focus on. Yes, in the back. This seems to deal with the patients or the people who will be using the services. But is there anything in there that would deal with the people who are getting paid by the services, the pharmaceutical Oh, yes, 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 yes. By the way, by the way, I should, I should have mentioned this. I don't know why I didn't think of this when I was preparing this. We passed a drug benefit uh, in 2002, and it was somewhat bipartisan. There were lots of fights over that as well, but everybody wanted a drug benefit. And the drug benefit is much more market-friendly than the rest of Medicare. 
so that it, it, it's kind of a premium support. You get a fixed amount of money, and then you go try to buy coverage for, your, uh, for, to, for drugs. Uh, and the CBO estimates, this is totally unheard of, were way above what it, what it actually cost, and it's because people are paying out of pocket as well as from, the, uh, in effect, the premium support that they're getting. So you have some controls on how much people are spending. Um, so that's, that's a good example of what premium support might produce. Now, there are lots of arguments about why they're not comparable and so forth, but, uh, but drugs, our drug coverages are quite good, and, they're gonna, and they are, at this moment, saving money. Medicare, women on Medicare will, will not accept Medicare payments. Right, I know that. Doesn't that is, matter, you can raise yeah. it, you can lower it, you can right. do what you want, they're right. not going to accept it. Right. What do you do about that aspect of it? Um, I, don't, I don't have the answer to that. Uh, but I can tell you this, the Congress has every year for the last, I think, seven years, there's a provision in the law that we're supposed to cut the payments even further below the ones that already people won't accept. And every year Congress overrides it. Uh, it, it's costing us billions of dollars, uh, and I would not be surprised that Congress will cut another, uh, pass another cut in doctors' payments, and then when it comes time to do it, they'll override that too. This is a wonderful trick that they pull to not do something and look like they're doing something, you know. So, but that I know that's a, that's a serious problem, and I, I don't know what the solution is going to be. But it's going to get worse and worse if we don't if we don't get more mechanisms into Medicare that. Consumers like you are focused on the price and look for lower prices. Yes. Yeah, I think there's bipartisan agreement on that. Yeah, I remember when uh, Ryan brought that up with you. Remember they had that spectacular thing where the president was in there with a bunch of Republicans and Democrats? Do you remember this? It was on national TV. And it was quite, I thought it was super impressive because they're very, very smart people. Um, and Ryan and the president had an exchange over this. And the president even said, you know, there, there ought to be room for tort reform in a comprehensive package. So, yeah, I think that could happen. Now, the lawyers, this is the problem in Washington. This is why the book Gucci Gulch is so useful for normal people who, you know, don't have to live in Washington and watch what happens. You have these guys who are, make a million a year or more. They're often former members of Congress. They're very good friends with the members of Congress. They have complete access. And they're going to go in there, and they're going to say, oh, no, no, oh, you don't want this tort reform. So there'll be a lot of pressure. And you'll see the same thing with the tax, closing these tax loopholes. Every single one of those loopholes has multi-million dollar organizations behind it that support it completely. And they will fight to the death to make sure Congress doesn't do the right thing. Yes? Your first chart on the uh, yeah. programs and the spending on the deficit portion of that, the debt portion, right. how much of that is from the borrowing from Social Security, the Social Security fund? Oh, oh, here's a delightful answer. None. What about Medicare? Because this is net interest payments. And when you see the statistics on the U.S. debt, the one that you almost always see is net debt. That does not include the money that government agencies owe to each other. That would add another $4 trillion or so. It's about 10 now. It would be about 14 if you included the whole thing. So that's not in there. Why not? <laughs> Why not? You need to spend a year in Washington. You wouldn't ask those dumb questions, you know? Yes? What concerns me, I guess, the one thing that concerns me is that you mentioned it underhandedly, but you mentioned it clearly. And that is that the Medicare problem has to be handled because we have no control on costs. Right. Every congressman <coughs> right here proposes it, proposes amendments, proposes improvements. I never hear anybody talk about controlling costs. Oh, yes, they do. They do. Oh, yeah. And Ryan not, has, only, has not yeah. only talked about it, he's put a plan on the table, which is extremely controversial. And if we pass the Ryan plan, 
we would basically cure the Medicare problem. Of course, we would cure it on the backs of the elderly. Uh, it, we just can't go as far as Ryan goes. But I always say this. I've worked with Ryan a lot. I think he's an extremely honorable guy. He put an interesting plan on the table and created lots of good debates. It's his opening bid. It's his opening bid. I think he's open to, in fact, we're, we've got some plans to actually test this in the public event at Brookings. And I think he will say, you know, this is, we could look at this again. Beginning negotiations. Yeah, absolutely. But that's the thing. We can't get to the stage where you can really, and, and think about it. If any of you were a member of Congress and you had big ideas and you were going to put a plan on, you would not open with your best and final offer. You would have a lot of room in there to negotiate. And I think that's what Ryan has done. Yeah. In the, uh, in the oh, house. wait a minute. I'm not supposed to call on you because you're no, going to no, ask no, me no, a tough no, question. No, this is a softball question. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. I, those, I specialize in those. In, in the Haskins uh, health care plan, right. uh, would the government set the parameters for the minimum mandatory yes. coverage of what's yeah. included yes. and what's excluded? Yeah. No, well, you do, you'd specify what's, what's included, which, you know, by process of elimination, yeah. you, it would eliminate some things. But it would be like Medicare. It would be a generous plan. It would not be some chintzy plan. It would be a generous plan. There are two plans on the table, um, the Rivlin Domenici and the Ryan plan, and they're both the benefits are fairly generous. And don't lose sight, you could get extra things, and there will be companies that will provide things that are not covered by, uh, by the mandatory components of the plan. But you just have to pay out of pocket for that. Understand, but the, the difficulty seems to me to be in if you've got a generous plan and you're covering all that more, all that number of more people, right? How is that going to be economically feasible? Well, because of the difference between McAllen, Texas, and San Jose or whatever. What was El Paso? I mean, really, we according to that and thought, I, I we could cut that. a third of Medicare without any impact on quality. So if you can have a mechanism that captures these market forces and people become better consumers, then we could really save money on Medicare. And people might be, I mean, at some point, you're getting very high quality services and almost as many as you had in the past, but because of the efficiency of the system, you're not spending more. In fact, you're spending less. I know that sounds like a fairy tale, but yeah, consider, read the Gwandi article, New Yorker, two years you're ago. Right. I, I did. Actually, and uh -huh. the difference a lot. Were of you the, persuaded? The, the uh, yeah. Well, a lot of the difference in that particular case you're citing happened to be because in the uh, expensive uh, area, the hospitals were doctor owned and they uh, really. Pumped, right. That, that, that was really that was a, yes. Yeah. But it, but in in um, El Paso, the doctors came together right. and provided especially what they did is they provided the whole panoply of care that people healthcare. need yeah. Yeah. yeah and they were able to economize and they watched each other and had you know checks on how many tests they were doing and all that so and this is partial answer to your question that the doctors and the hospitals were worried about efficiency and under a premium support plan they better be worried about it because there's a fixed amount of money and the American consumers are going to be looking for cheaper plans that give them the minimum of what they want. This, uh, you know, I've kept you too long. Um, this will be the last question, but I'd be happy to answer things. Are you already doing something to me? Oh, oh good. Okay. At the beginning of the Gun material, if I understood you right, you said that uh, public policy doesn't reflect the findings of social science findings, right? Um, boy, that opens a big. I'm going to say roughly speak. I have a chart I love. My follow-up uh, question, do you see that happening in the lifetime? Yes, yes. I I th I, it does happen now. It happens now. It's just, look, in a democracy, I have a pie chart that represents what happens in Congress. And it has a big old piece for the position of the chairman, a big piece for party philosophy, a big piece for the law that already exists because it's always difficult to try to change the law, and a little teeny eeny weeny sliver for evidence. And, you know, maybe that's not totally bad. We're in a democracy. People ought to have a, a chance to influence policy without having to read, you know, this dumb book that I wrote or something like that. But especially in these Obama initiatives, there's six of them, 
And uh, there are other examples I could give where social science, welfare reform, social science played quite an important role. Social science showed in welfare reform that we could organize programs that help people find jobs, and if we could figure out a way to give them the incentive to leave welfare and get a job, we're talking primarily about low-income, uneducated women, and we passed it, they left welfare in droves. And it was because we had good evidence that that is exactly what would happen. So it does have an impact now, but it's not overwhelming. And in some cases, it's totally ignored. What do you think the congruency now is in the percentage? I think it's always going to vary from issue to issue, and it's going to depend on who's in Congress. It's going to go back and forth. But I, if you could imagine some kind of rough average, I think on average, the role of evidence has increased, and it will continue to do that, which is good. So thank you all for your patience. Let me thank you all for coming. I'm sorry we couldn't coax Ron into an opinion or two, but we'll try next time. Uh, we'll, we'll be around for those of you who didn't get a chance to answer a question. And I hope we see you next week on the 26th for our immigration talk.